This is part one of the animal diversity lectures. Okay, I went a little too far, but anyway, this is just the title page, animal diversity. And um, some of the periods in the Earth's history as determined mostly by um, fossil evidence. Okay, so what we have is beginning, let's see, what would this be? Um, Three billion, eight hundred million years ago, we were in the Archaean Eon. Um, and then two billion five hundred million years ago, we were in the Proterozoic Eon. And then when we start um, really having evidence of living things was 540 million years ago, which began the um, Paleo, the Phanerozoic Eon, the Paleozoic Era, and the Cambrian Period. And um, that moved up to the Ordovician, the uh, Silurian, the Devonian, the Mississippian, the Pennsylvanian, and the Permian. And then we went into the Mesozoic era, which um, you've prob probably heard these um, terms, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And this was between 240 million and 66 million years ago. Um, so between 66 million years ago and now, we have been in the Cenozoic era, still the Phanerozoic eon, Cenozoic era. Um, tertiary period, which led to the quaternary period, which is the period that we're in as of this moment, the Cenozoic era, the quaternary period. Uh, the earliest animal fossils were of sponge-like creatures, as far as animal fossils. These weren't the earliest fossils. The earliest animal fossils were of sponge-like creatures. A is a picture of a cyclomedusa, and B is a Dickinsonia fossil. They date 650 million years ago during the Ediacaran period. Um, Ediacaran pe Karen period, sorry. Okay, so the Ediacaran period um, was here in the Proterozoic Eon which basically had early, middle, and late Proterozoic eras and the Ediacaran period. So those are the earliest um, animal fossils. And then in the Cambrian period, between 542 and 488 million years ago, we had the most rapid evolution of um, animal diversity. Most of the animal phyla in existence today originated then, and that includes the echinoderms. And that's why it's called the Cambrian explosion, by the way. That includes the echinoderms or spiny skinned organisms like the sea star and the um, sea urchin, the mollusk, which are soft bodied, that includes the squid, the octopus, the clam. Um, and what I'm thinking of, oysters, snails, um, slugs, all of these are mollusks. The worms, there are different worms. There are flat worms, um, there are segmented worms, and there are round worms. So we have three um, phyla of worms. The arthropods are the jointed leg animals. So um, the trilobites that you see in picture A and B are arthropods. And then the chordate, well all of these are pictures, I'm sorry, all, all of these are pictures of trilobites. These are trilobite um, fossils. <clears throat> and the chordates, which primarily are animals that have a backbone. There are a few exceptions, but most have a backbone. 
So what caused or led to the Cambrian explosion? Um, of course, like evolution in general, the Cambrian explosion is still debated. Environmental changes such as rising oxygen levels may have created a more suitable environment. The rising oxygen levels, of course, um, more than likely coming from the photosynthetic organisms that were that evolved before the animals, such as the plants, the algae, um, and the photosynthetic um, microorganisms. So if we look at the oxygen level, the oxygen level kind of peaked, and then it's just been kind of going up and down around this line. But it peaked around 300 million years ago um, at a little over, and what it looks like maybe up to 35% of the Earth's atmosphere. And it kind of hovers around 21% um, now. Most of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. Um, these are mass extinction events. Um, just based on the extinction events, based on um, the and it's the percent the percentage of extinction, the percentage of organisms that went extinct. Um, and it shows the millions of years before the present time. Um, so we had the end Triassic around 200 million years ago, and about, I don't know, 75 to 80 million years ago was the end Cretaceous. Um, now, this is a chart, a cladogram, if you will, um, of the um, different animal phyla, animal phylogeny, um, beginning with the first animal ancestor. All animals are called metazoa. And then that ancestor diverged, evolved into two different types of animals. Animals with specialized tissues which are eumetazoa, or animals with no tissues, which are parazoa. And then that ancestor evolved into the phylum that we call today the porifera, which only contains sponges. All the others, the eumetazoa, which do contain specialized tissues, that, that ancestor um, evolved into animals with bilateral symmetry and triploblastic, um, um, sorry, uh, development, meaning they have three um, germ layers um, and the radiata, which have radial symmetry and they only have two germ layers, they're diploblastic. Um, they have an endoderm and an ectoderm, whereas the bilateral, Bilateria um, have an endoderm, a mesoderm, and an ectoderm, which we will learn about later. The radiata formed into two different groups, um, diverged into two different groups. Basically, there were there were two ancestors, and one ancestor diverged into the cnidarians, which is your uh, jellyfish, and the other ancestor diverged into the tenophora, which are your comb jellies. The cnidarians are the ones that have stinging cells and paralyze their prey. The tenophora look like jellyfish, but they, they do not have stinging cells um, like the jellyfish do. Now, going back to the bilateria, those with bilateral symmetry means that they can be divided into two equal halves, means they have a left and a right, okay? They, um, uh, that ancestor evolved into an ancestor with a body cavity called a coelom, and then an ancestor with no coelom called an acelomate. And the acelomates evolved into the phylum today we call the acela. The coelomates evolved into the protostomes and the deuterostomes. The protostomes and the deuterostomes are both triploblastic, um, and when they form early in development, 
the two openings of the digestive tract, the mouth and the anus, the order that they form determines if it's a protostome or a deuterostome. So if the um, mouth forms first, that's a protostome, mouth first. And if the mouth forms second and the anus forms first, it's a deuterostome, so mouth second. So the protostomes then evolved into the ecdysozoans and the lophotrochozoans. The ecdysozoans shed <clears throat> their exoskeletons, and they include arthropods and nematodes, which are the um, like the insects and the roundworms, roundworms and arthropods. And the lophotrochozoans include the, the um, protostomes that do not shed their exoskeleton. And that would be the flatworms, like tapeworms, the rotifers, the ectoprocta, the brachiopoda, the annelids, which are your segmented worms, and then the mollusk, like your octopus. Both parazoa and eumetazoa evolved from a common ancestral organism that resembles the modern, modern day protist called coanoflagellate. So it is thought that the coanoflagellates were, um, are related to the um, ancestor of the first sponge. And the reason for that is because here's a coanoflagellate, which is a single organism, it's a single protozoan, has a flagella, and this is a coanocyte, which is a cell found in the lining in here of the, the inside of the sponge. <clears throat> and it helps it to filter food. Okay, protostomes. Seems like it went kind of fast. All right, well... <laughs> The, the protostomes, remember, are mouth first. Um, we classify them based on ones that um, shed their exoskeletons, and that would be the ecdysozoans. Cockroaches would be an example. And then the ones that do not shed their ex ex exoskeletons would be the lophotrochozoans. The tentacles of lophotrochozoans are called lophophores. Tentacles are feeding structures called lophophores. Um, the modern revisions to the evolutionary history um, and the phylogeny have been done based on nucleic acid and protein analysis. Of course, there are fossils that are so old, we don't have any DNA samples or any protein samples that we can use. But um, as much as we can today, we try to use DNA and protein and RNA um, to analyze how closely related the animals are to one another. All animals are eukaryotic. This is traits that all animals have. They're all eukaryotic, meaning the cells have a nucleus. They're all multicellular. And almost all have a complex tissue structure with differentiated and specialized tissues, but not all of them. Um, sponges do not have tissues. <clears throat> Most animals are motile, at least during certain life stages. Even the sponge, um, very, very early is motel, and then um, it becomes an adult, which is sessile, which means it doesn't move. It attaches and doesn't move. All animals require a food source, so they're heterotrophs, and they can be carnivores, herbivores, omnivores, or parasites. Carnivore means meat eating, herbivore means plant eating, omnivore means both, and parasite means they live off of a host. Most animals reproduce sexually. And have a fixed body plan. 